Okay, let's open our Bibles to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 through 7. But if you've been with us the last few weeks, you know that our focus will be verse 7. We're focusing on the husbands uh, in this series that we're in now. And uh, we want to look at this one very uh, potent, uh, brief but potent uh, message that Peter gives to the husbands in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Make it so we can see each other. So, okay, 1 Peter, verses 3, 1 through 7. Let's read God's word. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word, by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet Spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We ask you to please pour out your spirit on us. We pray, Lord God, that your spirit would do work in our hearts that no man can do, and that your word would pierce between bone and marrow, and Lord, it would unveil us, it would uh, expose us, it would heal us, it would strengthen us. Lord, we pray that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been thinking about uh, plucking uh, weeds from the garden of everyday life. We've been thinking about pulling up sins that get into the mundane spots in our lives, the tracts of land, if you will, uh, that occupy most of our uh, living days. And we've been thinking about the sins that often creep up there. And we've thought about uh, husbands and wives. Uh, We'll go on to think about children and parents and then about our work relationships. Uh, But but for now, uh, we're thinking about husbands. We we, we said that with wives, there were some particular difficulties, uh, particular sins that tended to creep in, uh, namely dishonor or being a doormat or being uh, contentious. And then we looked at uh, husbands, began to look at husbands, and noticed there can be a tendency uh, to be harsh. There can be a tendency not only to be harsh, but to be negligent. And now what I want to do this morning is look at a husband's tendency to be clueless. To be clueless. Major problem for men, just to be completely in the dark. And of course, Peter's answer to clueless men is that they become men of understanding. The opposite of being clueless is to become a man of understanding. Uh, I'm gonna submit to you uh, that most men, myself included, get married and they have no idea what just happened. They They have no idea what just became of them. 
and what has just been added to their lives. They don't understand. And Peter, wisely, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says that a virtue that every man needs to grow in, in marriage, is understanding. And you see it there in the passage, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. The old translations would say, live with your wives according to knowledge. Know what's going on. Understand what is happening and understand who she is. Now, here's the problem. The problem is, when we hear live with your wives in an understanding way, we hear that as people who live in a modern American culture. We hear that as people who've been steeped in an individualistic culture. And so when we hear, understand your wives, we think, what, what is my wife like individually? What is my wife like as opposed to all the other women on the planet? Is she a morning person or is she a night person? Does she love hospitality and hate gardening? Does she like, what is she like individually? And, and those are wise things to know. This is not a sermon against knowing your wife individually. Good luck just being married to a generic woman. That, that, that's not going to work. But it's not Peter's focus. When Peter says, understand your wives, his focus is not on understanding all the individual particularities of that individual woman. Now the second thing we tend to do when we hear, live with your wives is in an understanding way, is we've been steeped in this culture and so we immediately have psychological and especially pop psychology categories pop into our minds. And so we say, okay, how do I understand my wife? Is she an ESTP or is she an INFJ? And so we need to know her Myers-Briggs personality type. And once you understand that, then you're obeying the, the word of God. Now listen, we had some fun in our house uh, this week we were doing our personality tests and one of my kids started out the week going, those things are stupid and I, I hate them. And I said, I kind of feel that way too. And then we read him his and he's like, that is very remarkable. That's a very <laughs> remarkable, very remarkable experience to have that uh, read to me. And so, you know, we've had, you, you, you read, someone just reads you your personality type and family life, and one minute you're just elated, the world knows me, the next means you want to cry and crawl under a rock. That kind of understanding can be good. It can be good. It can be good to understand personality types. It can be helpful. It's not what Peter's talking about. Now, believe it or not, Peter had not received a copy of the Myers-Briggs personality test in advance when he authored this book. When Peter thinks about understanding your wife, he is not thinking in individualistic categories. He is not thinking in the categories of pop psychology. He is thinking in the categories of creation and redemption. He is thinking about who is she as a woman. What does it mean to be married to a woman. What is a woman, particularly? And, and what does it mean to understand that in the kindness and the providence of God, if you are a husband, you have been given a member of the human race to shepherd and to love and to lead and to guide? And so Peter will focus here when he says, live with your wives in an understanding way, not on personality type, not on idiosyncrasy, but he will focus on things that are true of all women. And believe me, if men understood this, they would be better husbands. And Emmanuel would be full of happier marriages. And honestly, the gospel would shine forth from this church with more glory. Peter gives us two things that need to be understood. Two things that need to be understood. Wives are physically weaker and equal in glory. They are physically weaker 
and equal, utterly equal in glory. And so uh, you see, uh, if you want a second point, here it is. Understand that they are weaker. The first one was understand. Understand they are weaker. And you see that right there in the text. It says, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the wife as the weaker vessel. Honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now, what does it mean to say that a woman is weaker than a man? What does it mean to say that a woman is weaker than a man? Well, some would say that women are weaker emotionally. And it is true that many women cry easier than men. But nowhere in the Bible is this viewed as a weakness. There's not a hint in the Scriptures The tears are the mark of weakness. When David wept, or Jesus wept, or Paul wept, we are never for a minute led to think that we are seeing them at their weakest moments. In fact, uh, what Christian could look at someone weeping over the sin and sadness of this world and regard that as a weakness? It's not a weakness at all. And a quickness to tears that sometimes surpasses men's is not what it means that a woman is the weaker vessel. That ought to be cherished and prized, not demeaned and diminished. What does it mean that women are weaker then? Well, some would say that women are weaker morally. You know, they just don't have the constitution, don't have the moral strength of a man. Let me just remind you that we just finished reading about Sarah. And if you know the context of Sarah, her husband was being a lily-livered chicken who decided that to keep himself out of trouble, he'd have her tell a lie so that he wouldn't get murdered, but she might wind up getting violated in the harem. And she proceeded through the whole thing with faith calling him Lord. This is not to be confused with moral weakness. This is a tough woman. This is a woman of faith. This is a woman of strength. And it's not an accident that when Jesus dies, the only people left standing of the disciples are the women. There is nothing in the scriptures, in fact, it is an absurd and even a heretical idea to insinuate the women are morally weaker than men. The truth is that men and women are totally depraved. Men and women are both completely sinful. And, and we love to do this. We love to just accentuate one, the sins of one sex over another. But the, when the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one, it doesn't mean Man, the men are really not righteous. And if you want to go down one more step, let me tell you about the ladies. Nothing of the kind. Nothing of the kind. There's nothing in the scriptures that would call into question the equality of men and women in terms of moral weakness. Let me say this. That doesn't mean there aren't morally weak women. There's all kinds of women who don't have a moral backbone to save their lives. But there's nothing about womanhood that makes a person more disposed to moral weakness than manhood. So what is the difference? Well, the difference up until five minutes ago in human history was patently obvious to everyone. And that's that men are physically stronger than women. Um, There was a study done by a Princeton scholar uh, where they uh, measured the deadlift, the squat, and the bench press of men and women. And women basically can lift in all of those events about 67% of what men can lift. Uh, Men tend to need less sleep than women. There is a physical strength that God has given to men that he has not given at the same degree 
to women. Now, when you say this, there's always some guy who says, I know a 6'3 Norwegian girl who can bench 600 pounds, and she's married to a Guatemalan guy who's scared of spiders. And I'm like, okay, we know that. That happens. There's an exception. But the exception does not undermine the rule. The rule is that for the most part, men are taller, broader, stronger than women. And Peter is telling the men of his church that they need to understand this. They need to reckon with it. It needs to be part of how they think about husbanding, that they are united with a weaker vessel, one who is more vulnerable. And, and you could add to that interpretation that women are not just physically weaker, but that God has placed them in a subordinate role in marriage, and so they're more vulnerable, not only having less bodily strength, but now being asked to submit to someone who is stronger. There, there, there's a potential for abuse here. And of course, human history says there is the actuality of abuse inside and out of the church in this relationship. And Peter's heading it off at the pass and saying it's utterly inappropriate. You need to understand that she's weaker. And the impulse that flows from understanding that she's weaker is totally countercultural. Her weakness is to bring about her honor. Her weakness is to bring about her honor. This is utterly different than the way the world works. The way the world works is remember the CEO's name, never forget it. Who was his secretary? Who cares? Keep the card of the owner of the company. Put it in your phone. Don't bother to say hi to the janitor. It's the little runt at school who gets picked on. It's the little old lady in the park who gets robbed. It's the old person at home who becomes the victim of a telemarketing scam. The human impulse is to pounce on weakness, to exploit weakness to use someone else's weakness to gain strength and to gain more power, to hop on top and climb to the top. That's the human impulse towards weakness, but not in the church. It is not to be in the church. And, and let me say it more, just more clearly, not, it's not Christ's attitude towards weakness. Imagine if Christ came and decided he would play tricks on us because of his weakness. I, I have a son, I have three sons, so there's a fair amount of testosterone-driven competition happening at any given moment in the Fullerton home. But I, I walk in the home and a ball passes through my legs. And I turn and there's a little smirk going, you loser, I scored one already. He didn't even know you were playing. But I'm winning. Capitalizing on my weakness. I'm probably fine for a teenage boy. Not going to be helpful for a husband in marriage. Jesus leads the way in teaching us to prize the weak. You remember uh, 1 Corinthians 1 God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. The doctrine of election is bent towards the weak. He chose the weak to exalt them and not to shame them. Or you remember the passage on spiritual gifts from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The parts of the body, that is the church body, the people of God, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. There's no appendixes in the people of God, no tonsils. 
that you can just pull out and throw away. The little ones that seem like they're making no difference are of utmost importance. They're, they're indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honor, we bestow the greater honor. Now, I have been in many church traditions where it is customary to give great honor to the pastor. And that's not entirely sinful because if we're told to give, of course, double honor to those in that kind of leadership. But I have never known a church tradition where it was customary and in the warp and woof of their life to just exalt as highest the weakest. Wouldn't that be a Christian thing to do? Wouldn't that represent tremendous growth at Emmanuel to just have a a disposition? The weakest members of the church walk in, they're like, okay, what do you think, I am a celebrity around here? They're just constantly being given honor. Many men, rather than giving honor to their wives as weaker, give the opposite. They're rigid, they're severe, they are exacting, they are constantly disappointed, they demean and despise the weaker vessel. They hold their wives to standards they themselves do not live up to. They get irritable when their wives do not perform as they wish. Give me one second here. I printed my sermon notes out kind of funny. John Calvin wrote this. The weakness of the female sex ought to make us not be too rigid and severe with our wives. Many men get irritable with their wives when they do not perform as they wish. But brother, instead of using your strength, and instead of me using my strength in an imposing way, we should use our strength to honor our wives, to pick up what she's not able to do. Now, when I talk about wives being weaker and men picking up what they're not able to do, please don't hear me uh, speaking as if every woman is a waif. That could be the furthest thing from the truth. Proverbs 31, woman is is a force of nature. And she's set out as an example. I am not trying to give uh, uh, women any sense that there's just an inherent weakness. It's, it's, a, it's a weaker than, not, a, not just a, an, an inherent weakness. And I'm also not trying to give women a tool to manipulate their husbands. You're stronger. You do it all, honey. No, but I am saying that a man, when confronted with weakness in his wife, should see it as an honor to honor her. If you come home and she's exhausted, it's not, of, it's not a sign of effeminacy to wash the dishes. It's the mark of a man. A man who wants to honor his wife. If we had more men like this, you know, I'm always nervous. We preach on marriage for weeks and think, what are the singles thinking? Well, let me just say this. If we had more men so eager to serve we may have more women less apprehensive about marriage. Okay, so they need to understand their wives are weaker bodily. And then secondly, there needs to be an understanding that they are weak, that they are, they are equal in glory. They're equal in glory. Notice this in the text again. It says, uh, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. So your wife, Peter says, is an heir with you of the grace of life. So she received grace from God that she didn't deserve, because that's the very nature of grace, to get what you don't deserve. And the grace she received made her an inheritor of eternal life. She's a daughter of the king. She's going to live in the castle in the sky with the king forever and ever and ever. And the women won't be in the basement and the men out on the patio. That's not the way that's going to work. 
She is a fellow heir of the grace of life. And brothers, this is consistent with every word of the scriptures, which is constantly beating the drum of the complete and total equality of men and women. In Genesis 1, God says, let us make man in our image, male and female, he created them. Men and women are utterly and completely and equally made in the image of God. Both have rationality, both have wisdom, both have creativity, both have been given bodies that long to create and make like God creates and makes. They are equal. And then they're equal in sin. There's none righteous, no, not one. And that's not just the Jew and the Gentile are unrighteous, it's the men and women are unrighteous. They're equal in sin. And they are equal in redemption. Now Galatians 3.28 is a verse that's often abused, but it's important that we understand what it means when it's not abused. Galatians 3.28 tells us there's no longer male or female or slave or free, but all are one in Christ. And of course, that doesn't mean when you become a Christian, you stop being a woman. It didn't mean that when slaves became Christians, they stopped being slaves. It meant and it means that everyone who gets saved, their primary identity, who they fundamentally are at the core, is that they are Christ. They are in Christ. The identity marker that trumps maleness or femaleness, slave or free, is that a Christian, male or female, is in Christ. They are on their way to heaven. They're a child of the King. They are His, and there's no tears according to the sexes at all, in the least. Eradicate it from your mind. And so she's weaker, but she's an equal. And many men have no idea what they have on their hands. Now, years ago, here at Emmanuel, uh, one of the members of Emmanuel came up to me and gave me a present. And it was wrapped, it was kind of a cylinder-shaped box. And I opened it up, and it just looked like the cheapest coffee maker I had ever seen in my life. And I hoped I wouldn't say anything rude, and I'd just be thankful. It was, and some of you know this, it was an AeroPress. And of course, what an AeroPress is, just a see-through cylinder. And it's got a see-through plunger and you plunge that coffee down in this. I didn't know that I was holding my wife's coffee dreams in my hands. Christy swears by the AeroPress. If I don't set the coffee maker at night, she's like, I'm gonna have to make an AeroPress because I need it now and I need it good. In the AeroPress, nothing makes it like that. But I was just looking at this thing. It looks cheap. It looks plastic. It looks gimmicky. I had to know about it before I really began to appreciate what it was I had on my hands. And what's amazing is that when a man is given a woman, it's an unbelievable thing because he's given someone who is weaker than him, someone who is a dependent, someone who is to be cared for, someone who is to be protected. But the one who is to be protected, the one who is a dependent to be provided for, is in every single way his equal. Now that's a hard thing for us to wrap our minds around because we just we tend to we tend to say, if someone is lower than me in position, they're lower than me in worth. But the Bible will not let us do that. The Bible is able, as I love to say, walk and chew gum at the same time. The Bible is able to hold two truths in tension. And marriages are stronger when those two truths come in tension. Which means this. Here's what this means. This one who's weaker than you has wisdom you don't have. I mean, you, you got a whole new brain added to you when you got married. 
Like the brain power of two instead of one. You got four hands now instead of two. And, and she's been called a helper. But that, now, I actually have to go off on that for a second. The Genesis 2 story where Adam is given Eve, it's, just a, it's such a remarkable story. Because of course, you know, what's going on in Genesis 1? That's good, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. And then God comes to Adam and he's, that is, that is not gonna do. That's not, the whole place is gonna be like a locker room in minutes. If we don't solve this problem. It's not good for this man to be alone. And then he says this, and, and I can't turn them the text there right now, but you go look at it later. He says, I'll make a helper suitable for me. You know what happens immediately? It's like the movie cuts away. And right when God says, I'll make a helper for him, God parades every animal in front of Adam in the world. Okay, I'm gonna make a helper for him. So here's a horse. Horses are good. I mean, if you wanna gallop across Eden, can't beat a horse, okay? And, uh, and then the monkeys come around. I, hey, why don't you go get me a banana monkey and, and see what you can do for me. But you know, conversationally, monkeys are not strong. They're not strong. They do sign language, but it's not a very satisfying experience, right? And then, and then the dogs come around, and dogs are fantastic. Whoever said they were man's best friend is delusional. Okay, I like my dog. I like my dog a lot. Like a lot, don't be messing with my dog. I like my dog a lot, but you know, whatever I say, the dog just goes. It's <laughs> probably why I like my dog so much. But you know, but, it's just, but, but a dog cannot have the mind to mind, soul to soul interaction that a man and a woman are capable of, not one bit. Can't ever get there. You can talk to the dog for years. Maybe they'll start raising their paw at the right time. It's as far as it goes. And then once all the animals are named, God says to Adam, I guess you better sleep now. And he pulls a rib out from his side and he crafts the woman out of the man. And nobody ever got what happened there better than Matthew Henry. He said the woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon him, but out of his side to be equal with him under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. I think the theology we've laid down here is actually the key to obeying what we've said in past weeks. Why should you not be harsh? Because you're dealing with a daughter of the king. And he doesn't want anyone teaching, talking to his girl like that. Why should you be nourishing? Because you have been entrusted with someone who's your equal and yet, and yet, dependent on you. You should pour out for her. We recently went through the whole courtship process. My daughter got married to a great guy. I love you, Clay. And he was honorable through that whole process. But I'm going to tell you what, if he hadn't been, it would have been bad. <laughs> it would have been so bad. And I think the warning at the end of this passage is the Lord saying to husbands, it's going to be bad for you if you don't treat my daughters right. Do you see that? He says, show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Is there a grace in the Christian life that doesn't come to us through prayer? More power, more love, miracles, 
It's the assurance of salvation, spread of the gospel. You name it, anything a godly man wants comes through prayer. And here's what God says to you. If you get married, the success of that prayer life is not dependent on you getting an hour in your calendar. It's about you living with that woman like you know who she is. That she's weaker and she's your equal and she's to be honored. So the stakes are high, brothers. For me and for you, the stakes are high. From the human dimension, if we do not understand our wives, they won't flourish. We all know that life flourishes or dies depending on how we care for it. Plants die without water. Children wind up stunted in their growth when they're not fed. If you feed them, they become athletes or artists. And wives will thrive more often than not if we give to them what God calls us to give to them. Honor, love, cherishing, nourishing. I know a woman who's been married three times Christian woman, can't explain all the circumstances that led to this, but her first husband committed adultery, gaslighted her, made her feel crazy. This experience left her exhausted, full of self-doubt, and then deeply self-reliant and not determined not to be burned again. Her second husband hit her once and then twice, and after a third time she left him. And that experience left her devastated, weeping, destroyed, demoralized, often incapacitated with grief. She became hard and angry. She married a third time, and this time to a man who had experienced a similar betrayal, but this time the man was a gentle man of God. And each year with him, she's become more calm, more self-assured, more loving, more tearful, more soft in the best kind of way. And his understanding way has caused a wilted flower to blossom. Wherever we're at, brothers, in our marriage, is we can repent, we can do a grant teal, we can pursue brokenness, and we can see our wives flourish. But even bigger than the human aspect, of course, is the divine aspect, which is if we don't treat our wives well, our prayers will be hindered. The the source of all grace will be stopped up for us. You can't be talking about healthy church life and wanting to see a revival and not uh, be repenting of what's happening at home because the prayers of the church will be hindered. This might seem like a little detour for a few weeks on marriage. It also might be the most strategic thing we ever do in terms of the advance of the gospel in our midst. So I want to do what others have done in my life at different times. And I want to call my brothers to repent and to turn away from all harshness, from all irritability, from all rigidity, from all sexual betrayal with live women or pornographic mirages. I want to call you to run away from those things urgently and immediately. And brothers, I know the temptation that comes into your hearts that keeps us from repenting. I know because they've come into my heart. What about her sins? I mean, I know I've been angry and rude and disrespectful and negligent and betrayer looks at porn, but she's lied, nagged, dishonored, and emasculated me. Maybe she has. But brothers, leaders lead. You gotta take the speck out of your own eye. If you wanna get, if you wanna take, you gotta get the log out of your own eye if you want to get the speck out of hers. It is my consistent experience in marriage that when I press Christy for repentance on a particular issue, 
my efforts are not nearly as fruitful as when I pursue my own repentance for a sustained period of time. She almost always in that situation comes around to a deeper repentance than I ever imagined. And I know other temptations that will come to you not to repent fully. You know, a lot of guys, they feel bad. They feel bad for who they are as husbands. They feel bad. They don't like it. But they confess begrudgingly, partially, kind of miffed that they had to repent. Sorry. Don't you love that one when you get in an argument? I'm sorry. So it's, so it's, I can tell you are. You certainly are, aren't you? Sorry. There's a, there's a different kind of sorry, though, isn't it? Where we're actually cut to the heart by our sins. Where we actually make ourselves vulnerable to the one we've offended. And it's very fruitful. It's very effective. Some of you will resist this call to repentance, saying, oh, this is one more example of modern preaching that goes hard after men and easy on the women. That's a real thing. That is a real thing. I mean, we've all been there when some preacher just laid into the men on the Father's Day sermon, and everyone goes, ah, ah, that's all they needed. That's good. Thank you for doing that. You ever seen a preacher just tear a strip off the women for Mother's Day? Partiality. It's wrong. But brothers, I haven't gone easy on the sisters. We've talked as clear as we can about disrespect, lack of submission, not being a doormat. I don't think there's any sisters who are thinking, man, he really just, he was just so encouraging those last few weeks. That was just such a nice experience. I'm trying to deal with equal weights and measures. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. What's good for the men is good for the women. But once you say all that, brothers, you're the leader. And you can't go on with this sort of like, I'm the leader thing, and oh, I love Jocko Willink, and total responsibility, you know, extreme. Except when it's my marriage, I'm going to give you a couple more. Well, here's what we're going to do. I got a few more minutes, and I, I can't cut them down. So I'm going to keep preaching. We're not going to serve the Lord's Supper. Maybe, word, we could have a closing song once I'm done. Because uh, I want to give you some positive reasons. Not just God won't listen to your prayers. I want to give you some very positive reasons to repent. Some very positive reasons to repent. And, and the first one, I got to admit, it's, it's, a, it's, a little, it's a little strange, and I'm going to try to keep it as PG as possible. Uh, but it seems like Peter is actually saying in this passage, and I'm going to show you, don't worry, that really your whole life is kind of supposed to be like making love. It's really fascinating. Uh, over and over and over in this passage, Peter uses terms with deeply sexual overtones. Living with her is actually a term that has deeply sexual overtones. The one that most people will recognize, living with her in an understanding way, most translations are going to say according to knowledge. And if you've read your Old Testament, you know what it is to know someone. Peter's alluding to this. He's alluding it to so much that a commentator like, say, David Helms will say this passage is actually all about sex. The emphasis on the woman's body. She's the weaker vessel. So Peter, live with her, sexual overtones. According to knowledge, sexual overtones. The weaker vessel. It's, it's honor her the way a man who's honorable honors her in bed, the way he cares for someone weaker than him. Well, I can't get to the place where I think this whole passage is about sex, but I, I also can't get away from the overtones. So it's almost like Peter is saying, the way a man treats a woman when he treats a woman right 
when that strength encounters her weakness in the most intimate moments, and there's this restraint of strength that honors and respects in those most intimate moments, that's supposed to be the whole time. That's what it's like in the kitchen. That's what it's like in the living room. That's what it's like in the backyard. That's what it's like all the time. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good way of looking. That makes them for some happy marriages. And it's not just to get her to that moment, but it's because that ought to characterize every moment in our lives. Now that's Christ-like. Strength that moves towards the weaker one for their delight, for their care, for their kindness, for their pleasure. That's what we're being called to. And, and brothers, I just want to say this to you. I've been hearing some very encouraging things about things happening through these sermons. Very encouraging. I talked to one brother the other day. He said, I've been battling with bitterness. I went home, gathered my whole family, confessed this bitterness was distracting me from loving them. Pretty soon his wife's confessing sins. Pretty soon his kids are forget- confessing sins. And you know, you know what happens when people start humbling themselves and confessing their sins? God gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. If I go in there and confess all my sins, she will lord it over me. She will say, I was right. She might. And she might be right. But you can press through that. You can press through that. You can press through that to the place where you actually become an example of leading in weakness, in humility. And if after a while, when I got saved, when I got saved, uh, it was amazing, it was radical, it was wonderful and my mom didn't believe it. She said, no, no, I've seen this boy go through phases before. And then I got convicted of all the money I had stolen from my mom. And then I cut her a check and sent it to her. And she said, this must be real. (laughs) Go forward in repentance until she's looking at you going, this must be real. And don't tell her she should have realized it was real yesterday. Because you're sorry. Oh, you're sorry, all right. (laughs) Everything we could want as a church. Starting at the furthest out. Missionaries going to the nations. Churches being planted throughout Kentucky. Transformation to every level of society as godly people take their place. Churches that are full of love. Kids that actually believe the gospel. We can't have any of it without God answering our prayers. Amen? And we can't have God answering our prayers if the men and especially the husbands of the church are not repenting of their sins so that God is not hindering those prayers. So, word's gonna come up and lead us in a song. Maybe you wanna grab a few guys and have them pray for you. Maybe you wanna find a place on these steps and have me or one of the elders pray for you. Maybe you wanna beeline it with some friends to the chandelier room. Have somebody pray for you. It doesn't have to be a public response, but it can be. And I'll just say this, sanctification is slow and continual, but sometimes there are decisive moments. Sometimes there are moments where you say, this ends now. And the rest of your life, you still may be picking up little weeds, but the big root's been taken out. And there's victory from there forward. And I would just say to you, go for that. Don't let anything hold you back from that. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your grace, caring for us and loving for us, loving us, strengthening us. I pray you would make us a repentant people. 
And I pray that the wives of Emmanuel would be the most cherished and honored of wives in the world. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.